Hey guys, it's Kathy. I just wanted to tell you all about a couple of resources that you may be interested in. First is the weekly newsletter called the FUMS Friday Night Six Pack. It goes out at 5 p.m. Eastern every Friday because it's 5 o'clock somewhere, right? <laughs> it contains links to the top six happenings in the world of MS that week. Another great email list to sign up for, the Patients Getting Paid list. I'm working on an online course for those of us in the chronic community that either lost our jobs and need some flexible opportunities or that just want to supplement their existing income. Think being able to work from an infusion center or home or wherever and getting paid. If that sounds like something you might be interested in learning more about, sign up at fumsnow.com forward slash patients getting paid. And I'll let you know as soon as I launch that course. Thanks everybody. And FUMS. Welcome to the FUMS Now podcast show, where you'll gain information, inspiration, and motivation for living your best life with multiple sclerosis. Find us online at FUMSnow.com. I'm your host, Kathy Reagan Young. Dr. Aaron Boster is a board certified clinical neuroimmunologist specializing in multiple sclerosis. He provides diagnosis and treatment for all types of MS, as well as a wide range of neuroimmunological conditions. He received his undergraduate degree from Oberlin College and his medical degree from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. He started a YouTube channel to educate patients and care partners about MS in an easy-to-understand, no-nonsense way, and it's really taken off. He's all the talk in the world of MS, and today, he's here talking to us. How lucky are we? Let's go meet him. Dr. Boster, thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You, my friend, are a bona fide YouTube star with over 15,000 subscribers to your YouTube channel. That's kind of crazy. That's where I first learned about you, and um, we're going to come back to that in just a minute, but first... I read that you became interested in MS because your uncle suffered from it and your, um, your mother and your grandmother were his caregivers. So you saw firsthand sort of the ravages of MS, both for the patient and the caregivers or families. Can you tell us a little bit about that time and how that influenced your decision to become a neurologist in general and an MS specialist in particular? I would be happy to, uh, you know, all of us enter into our vocations differently. Uh, and, you know, my entrant uh, moments into MS were really when I was 12. Uh, my uncle, Mark, was diagnosed with MS when I was a child. Uh, and I grew up in a very tight-knit third-generation American family watching him deteriorate. Uh, I remember asking my mom, why can't Aunt Uncle Mark read? Um, you know, why has he stopped driving? Um, why is it hard for him to finish sentences? And Uh, As a child, those are some of my memories. And I remember vividly at age 12, I came into my grandmother's house. Uh, My mother and grandmother were sitting at the kitchen table. My uncle was in the other room in his wheelchair. And my mom and grandma were holding hands and they were crying. Mm. And they weren't crying because my uncle had MS. I mean, he had had MS for quite some time. They were crying because they were frustrated. They couldn't get a hold of their doctor. And they were scared and they felt uh, marginalized and alone. And, you know, my family were educated, we had resources, and, um, and it was, you know, it didn't matter. Uh, and this predates the interwebs, this predates, you know, the, the, uh, the easy access to information and resources that you and I now benefit from. And I, I promised my mother that I would learn to do that. Now, I, I didn't really know what I was telling her when I was 12. You know, I didn't know right. that I'd be bald by the time I finished my training or that I'd complete the 27th year of school. <laughs> Or, you know, I didn't know any of these things. I just knew that nobody should make my family feel that scared and alone. And, you know, nobody should make people in my hometown feel that scared and alone. And so I was the weird kid in high school that, you know, when they said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be an MS neurologist. And, and wow. um, I, would, I would get funny looks, uh, you know, and I actually chose an undergraduate with a, a very strong neuroscience uh, major uh, available because that was what I was pursuing. Uh, and so I've had a rather directed course. Um, yeah. I, I, to your point, and, and I, I really embrace the word care partner. Uh, I think that the people in our lives, the village members that, that we have are, are partners in our care. And, and, and to your point, I saw what it meant to have MS from the vantage point of uh, my uncle 
and from his care partners, from my mother, from my grandfather, from my grandmother. Um, I, I knew what that meant long before I knew the immunopathogenesis of MS or the immunology behind the disease process. So I think I entered into my medical education with a bit of a different uh, vantage point, if you will, than maybe the next guy. Absolutely. A really important one. <laughs> I wish more entered into it with that knowledge. Um, so, okay, there you are, an MS specialist in Ohio. So what makes you decide to start a YouTube channel? Well, that's a, it's a funny story. You know, I, I was constantly trying to evaluate how to improve upon the lives of the people that I get to work with. And it, it struck me that every single patient, almost without exception, has some form of social media. Mm-hmm. I would come into the clinic room and my patient, whether they were an octogenarian or whether they were 20 something, they're on their phone. Mm-hmm. And, and I would say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just checking my feed. You know, <laughs> and, and it, really, it really got me thinking that we, we see people in clinic two to four times a year on average. And if we spend a half an hour each visit, we could brag that we're spending an hour uh, a, a year with these people uh, in, in trying to help them up their game and, and combat a chronic disease. And, and that's laughable, to be honest with you. I mean, mm-hmm. think about it this way. If I was to teach you chess, the game of chess, mm-hmm. and we met for half an hour every three months, you would stink at chess. You wouldn't be very good at <laughs> chess, you know? And so I... I thought if there was a way by which I could educate patients in between visits in a way that was palatable to them and that was uh, easily digestible, that might be a win. And so I started mucking around with social media, you know, full transparency. I didn't have a Facebook page. I didn't know what a tweet was. (laughs) Um, And I certainly didn't spend time on YouTube. But, I, you know, this happened kind of gradually starting in probably around uh, 2015. Uh, we started a um, a, a Twitter uh, page, and I started to tweet things out, and then um, I, I got into into Facebook, and really where where things landed, and I still maintain those, uh, but is with YouTube channel because mm-hmm. I can make these easily digestible videos on my own time. You know, I do this in the evenings and on the mm-hmm. weekends when the family allows, and then. Somebody impacted by MS, whether they are in Iran or whether they're in Casablanca, Morocco, or in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, or Columbus, Ohio, they can watch it on their own time when it's convenient for them. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 really uh, picked up its own it, its own energy. And and I'll be honest with you, it's something that I actually look forward to doing. I really enjoy it, uh, and it's it's such a, a gift to me. When someone impacted by MS in Scotland uh, sends me a comment and says, hey, you helped me understand a concept. You made it easier for me to talk to my provider. You, you helped me explain to my wife something that was challenging. Those are, those are really feel-good moments to me. Right. Uh, and yeah. it, and, um, and it's, it's something that I, I, I now actively seek out and enjoy doing. I'll also tell you candidly that you know, when I started, I, I, I don't know two things about videography or any of these things. And I now have an entire lexicon of things that I never uh, knew about before. And I have what I joke to my wife is a big boy camera. You know, I have like a professional <laughs> um, a fancy camera. And, nice. and it's, really, it's really very fun. Uh, so for Good. me, it's been really enjoyable. I've, you know, I've opted to not monetize the channel because I'm not looking to make a dollar. I'm, I'm, I'm looking to up people's game. And, yeah, and, and you are. Fun, well, thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's really, it's a feel good thing for me. Well, it's a feel good thing for a lot of us. I mean, the way that you explain things is so clear and so helpful. And I'm confident you've heard this before, but this is when I put this out to my community that I was going to be interviewing, this is what I kept hearing over and over. My family didn't understand what MS was. Um, Sometimes they questioned me. They didn't understand that, you know, there was actually pain involved. Um, They made me feel like I was making things up. But I can show them a doctor who speaks in their language and can explain this to them. And it's changed the dynamic of my family. So that's what a gift. Um, I mean, that's huge. That's so huge. So thank you so much for doing this. It's it's my honor, honestly. Um, You know, and I think that if my grandparents were alive, if my uncle was alive, I think they would appreciate, um, you know, or or, um, appreciate what, what I hope they would appreciate what I'm doing. 
You know, I, I, I realized something years ago when I was in an academic uh, neurology department at a ivory tower that if, if we as, as neuroimmunologists understand something and we can't convey it to the person we're helping, we might as well not understand it. <laughs> Good point. You know, because I don't, I don't help people get better by cutting them. You know, I'm not a surgeon. I don't, I don't do a procedure where I remove something or, you know, connect two things together surgically. I try to help people essentially by asking them to please consider doing something, Right. you know, whether, whether that is to be adherent with a challenging disease modifying therapy or to avoid tobacco smoke or to exercise as part of their lifestyle or, or what have you. It's really just me saying like, would you please? And what I found in my clinical practice is that if I don't do an adequate job of helping the human understand why, they're less likely to do it. You know, yeah, whereas true. conversely, if I, if I can help them understand, look, I don't want you to smoke because smoking speeds up your disease by almost 50%, and it's the most modifiable risk factor in MS, well, then essentially that human will do my job for me. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that social media and YouTube in specific is a great conduit for education and empowerment. Yes. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's, the, I, and I just, I love that. Well, excellent use of the medium, doctor. And you're doing so much good for so many people. I don't want to, you're a very humble man and I don't want to embarrass you, but I can't overstate this really, how excited everybody was in my community that I was going to be interviewing you. And they all wanted me to thank you for what you're oh doing. Oh my goodness. So, well, you know, thank you. I'm honored. And I, I joke, you know, lies and flattery will get you everywhere with me. But, <laughs> Perfect. But, but uh, <laughs> but it's still well, very kind. How do you choose the subject matter for each of your YouTube videos? Oftentimes, um, I, I think about what are the topics that I'm discussing with people in clinic. For example, um, I may, in a given clinic day, explain a particular mechanism of action for a drug to a family. And then I think, well, you know, if, if this family had that question, maybe some other families have a similar question. And so a lot of the ideas are just born out of clinic discussions. I, um, I love doing live streams. Uh, it's kind of a fun mental juggling for me. I'm dyslexic. And so reading the, um, reading the mm. scrolling uh, chat while I try to maintain eye contact with the camera is really mental Holy gymnastics cow. for me. Yeah. And, and I enjoy doing it. But I can't always address all of the questions. You know, I can't get to them sure. all. And so another very rich source of ideas for future videos come from questions that I just don't get to. Right. Um, so and so, nice. you know, when I'm done with the, with the live stream, I, I take great pleasure in then reading through the chat mm-hmm. and I copy and paste all the questions that I didn't get to. And I just keep them in a folder on my computer. And so that's another place where I can go and say, Oh, that's a heck of a question. I'm going to make a video on that. Mm-hmm. Um, Got it. And, and the, you know, it's, if, if something comes to mind, um, I, I, I've had a couple of occasions where I've cared for people with MS that are incarcerated, for example. And that's a pretty, um, if you'll excuse the expression, fringe topic. Mm-hmm. But I just thought, what the hey, hey, I'll make a video and talk about some of the challenges of having a chronic autoimmune condition and while you're incarcerated. So, you know, that's kind of where they come. And the, the, last, the last place, uh, really, I have, a, I have an opinion. I'm, I'm an opinionated guy as it comes to this field. And it's not always the mainstream opinion. For example, my approach to the early application of highly effective medicines isn't standard. And so I also will sometimes use the YouTube platform just to share my biased opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm allowed. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, there are certain videos I, I get very, very passionate about. Um, uh, and, and it's just a forum that I can share my perspective. And it, you know, it doesn't make me right. It just makes me opinionated. But I figure if someone doesn't agree, they don't have to watch. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Love it. And by the way, any of those fringe topics, you are, I would love to have you back again. And let's talk about them right here. Because I mean, I have, (laughs) I have a platform called FUMS. Fringe is my friend. So I I love that. You know, I, I, I I accept the invitation. I would love to do that with you. So, um, Speaking of all your videos, I love them. I really love them. But one in particular, and that is um, the end of life and advanced directives video that you did a few weeks ago. And I just want to preface it a little bit because early on in my 
pod career. I'm using air quotes there. Um, (laughs) I interviewed somebody about organ donation Uh and I got a ton of pushback and like I was somehow, um, I don't know, uh, setting an expectation of an early demise because of MS, where my point has always been, we all have the same shitty prognosis. Nobody's getting out of this one alive. So I feel like being prepared has nothing to do with uh, MS. It has everything to do with uh, life because it does, in fact, end. So Having said all that, um, you did such a huge service in talking about this subject. Um, I, I, I just, I wish you would share, you did share a story on there. I wish you would share stories of, um, you, you talked about being in a room when a patient had an event that they'd likely not going to recover from and their family and friends were just sort of being twisted inside out trying to figure yep. out what to do because the patient hadn't told them what they wanted. If you can elaborate on that a little bit, I think this is super important. I would be happy to, and thank you for highlighting that video. Uh, it's, you're absolutely right that it, it's remarkable. Every single one of us is going to die. Um, and that's the fact of life. And yet, um, in our culture, it's kind of taboo to talk about it. Yeah. And to your point earlier, if you talk about it, people think you're being morbid or that you're, you know, that you're yeah. wanting to end your life or something, and that's yeah. simply not the case. Or you're and hastening think, it somehow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, <laughs> so come on, strange. be happy. So, so I think that for various reasons, we, we avoid these uncomfortable topics. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I've been a staff neurologist in hospitals for a decade and a half. And unfortunately, there's a lot of things that are worse than death. And they're almost yeah. all neurologic. And I'm talking about someone, God forbid, that suffers a devastating heart attack and their brain is cut off of oxygen for a half an hour. And they're not, they're not dead Mm -hmm. and they're not uh in a um you know they're not brain dead but they're in a persistent vegetative state Mm -hmm. where their their lower brainstem functions are intact you know so they can breathe and their heart beats but they're not aware of anything around them they can't see hear feel smell they can't think things Mm -hmm. um and they're not going to change and it is a absolute horrible place to be Mm-hmm. And all too often, this is an unplanned event, of course. And, you know, the scenario is, is that the son or daughter that lives in town is at the bedside and the, the son from California flies in on a red eye. Mm-hmm. And many family members and friends are, are suddenly gathering and none of them have any advanced directives for what that human in the bed who's in the present vegetative state wanted. Right. And so what ensues in addition to the horror of the medical situation is a all out battle. You know, we need to end dad's life. How dare you say that Mm -hmm. we have to keep him alive at all costs. And, and I've, I've been Mm -hmm. subject to, to these, these discussions many, many times. Mm -hmm. And where I try to counsel the family and boy, this is hard to do is to say, it's not the, the question posed is not what do you want for your dad? Right. But if your dad was awake and could share his wishes, what would he say? Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes when you, when you help direct them in, in, in that way, they, they know the answer. They'll say, well, actually, X, Y, Z. Right. But, but more often than not, hence the desire to make the video, they say, well, God, I don't know. Yeah. You no know, conversation and, uh, prior. Yeah, exactly. Right. I sent out a, I sent out a, a, a quick Twitter poll um, where I said, you know, which village members have you talked to about end of life wishes? Sorry. And thirty three percent said nobody, and and that was really what prompted me. I said, I gotta, I gotta address this. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you know, and, and I, it's very, very challenging um, because there's a tremendous amount of guilt. There's, a, you know, there's a feeling of if I choose to withdraw care on my dad, I am choosing to kill my father, which is mm-hmm. not not really Crazy. true. Um, and, and so. All of these horrible emotions and bad situations can be completely and utterly mitigated or obliterated yeah. by simply having an informed conversation when everybody is able to communicate. And yes. so I think, you know, it was my hope that, that the video would serve as a bit of a call to action. You watch the video and then you call your wife in the other room or, you, you know, you, you call yeah. your daughter on the phone and say, hey, listen, 
here are my wishes. And yes. it's, a, it's a gift to your family. Such now, a gift. It's your final yeah. gift to give your family. Absolutely. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Because that way, instead of chaos and emotional turmoil, everybody says, mom was terribly clear. She yeah. said that she would not want to be kept in this position. Right. You know, I'll, I'll tell Easy. you one, one brief story. Um, I was, I, I believe I was an intern. Um, and so we're going back a few years, um, you know, to cobblestone roads and horse, uh, horse <laughs> carriages. but I, I believe I was an intern and I was in, um, or I was a very junior neurology resident, but it was early on in my education. And, um, um, a patient, uh, a gal who was probably in her maybe eighties, seventies, eighties, she had suffered a terrible event. Um, she had had a very devastating stroke. Mm. Uh, she w- couldn't communicate verbally uh, and she didn't really understand language all that well. In one side of the body wasn't moving, and she couldn't swallow safely. Oh, and her two sons came in from out of town, and they were very nice gentlemen. Mm-hmm. And they said to me very clearly, "We've had this conversation with mom. She wants no um, tubes. She wants no breathing tubes." And I said, "Well, okay. She doesn't need a breathing tube to breathe. She doesn't want to have CPR, or you know, if, mm-hmm. if her heart stops." And I said, "No problem." And then they said, and she wants no feeding tubes. We don't, you know, no, no NG tube in her nose to mm-hmm. feed her. And I said, well, wait a second, guys. This is a very fresh stroke. We're coming in onto the weekend. Would you please let me feed her? You know, because if she gets weak, she's not going to be able to recover from this. Mm-hmm. And they said, doctor, she was very clear. No, no tubes. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I pleaded with them and I asked them if they would please allow me to, to feed her for the course of the, of the weekend. And, um, and they acquiesced. They, they said, okay. And the rationale was, if she turns the corner, I want her to have as much oomph and as much energy as possible. Mm-hmm. And so, so they agreed to do that. So we went through the weekend and they didn't come in on the weekend. Um, I was, you know, but I, I rounded and took care of this woman um, throughout the course, of the, the course of the weekend. Monday comes by and after rounds, I come back to the patient room and the, and the two brothers are there. And they said, Dr. Boster, we, we honored your request. Mm-hmm. We allowed you to feed her. Now pull the tube. Mm-hmm. I lost it. Mm-hmm. I started crying. I, I was really emotional. You know, because I knew that if I did that, I wasn't going to be able to help her. Mm-hmm. And I actually um, did something that I haven't done very many times in my career. I called an ethics consult. Now, th- this is just where there's these medical ethicists that um that are on staff and they can help doctors and families but in this case it was for my it was for my benefit to be honest to come and kind of think through these cases Mm -hmm. and so the medical ethicist met with me and she said if this was an invasive procedure you know like um like an ECMO device that's that's breathing for her lungs Mm -hmm. would you have an issue with the family's request and I said no and she said to this family that tube is the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. And it's her right. And she was clear. You know, mm-hmm. the, the family um, wasn't at odds. Here was a situation where I, as a young doctor, was really struggling. Mm-hmm. And we pulled the tube. I mean, and when I say pulled the tube, it's not a breathing tube. It was a feeding tube. It was right. just to give her energy. And, um, and she became weak and she eventually died. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as I reflect back on that, that was an education for me, Aaron. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, I really am, am very lucky for that lesson. The family had already had the conversation. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the brothers who were the sons of the, the patient, they were at peace. They were clear. Um, mm-hmm. And how cool is it that they were able to feel that way? Yes. Yes. But you know, that, that taught me a lot. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. And I'll, I'll share too, that, um, I had a dear friend who lost her parents, uh, very very young. I think they were in their fifties, maybe early sixties at the same time in a bad car accident. They had never had a conversation about that. So she was left trying to figure out, um, you know, what What they would want. And right. And, um, so long story short, they both died. Um, and she was absolutely taken to the cleaners in terms of, um, funeral costs because there were, there were no, there was not even a conversation ahead of time. So, yep. you know, she said, my parents would kill me to know that I just spent $20,000 on a casket for each one of them. Yep. But 
this funeral director got a hold of me in my, you know, most vulnerable moment and said, doesn't mom deserve this? Doesn't dad deserve this? And it was later that my friend said to me, you know, if we had just had a conversation, it would have taken the burden off of me to make any decisions. They, I, what a gift that would have been. So from that point forward, I had the conversation with my parents. I really pushed and put, they were in their seventies, had made no decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone was very uncomfortable with the conversation. I just said, too bad. We're going to push through the discomfort. And my father right. ended up having a, um, a hemorrhag- hemorrhagic stroke. Um, so and sorry. thank you. Uh, you know, we all flew there and there was a decision to make. I felt there was no decision to be made. I had spoken with my parents, both of them. I was clear as a bell. So I honestly, yes, I, same thing with my mother. Um, You know, I made the decision for both of them. And I feel like that is one of the greatest gifts I ever gave to another human being. Because all I was doing was honoring their wishes that they had shared with me. So it it, it takes something that, yeah, it takes something that, um, if you haven't discussed it, there's tremendous amount of guilt and, and fear and yes. it turns it into an empowering experience. Yes. It really you're able is. To, you're able to be the voice of that person, you know, just for the record, since this is recorded and hopefully uh, exists in perpetuity, I'm going to share my wishes. You know, Excellent. so, so if God forbid, I'm not able to, to, you know, talk or communicate if I'm, and it doesn't look like there's a high likelihood that I'm going to leave the hospital, you know, in the condition I came in in. I don't want to be resuscitated and I don't want to be intubated. Now, if I need to be intubated temporarily for like a weekend or like a couple of days, so be it. But if it mm-hmm. then becomes clear that it's going to need to be required, then I want them to pull that too. And uh, I'll also extend my, my wishes to include what I want done with my body. I want to donate my body to a medical school mm-hmm. um, for, to, for as a cadaver. You know, when, when I was in med school, um, in my first year of medical school, we had a, a full year of what's called gross anatomy. Mm-hmm. Gross doesn't mean yucky. Gross means kind of not under a microscope, you know, stuff you can see with the naked eye. Mm. And, and there was a cadaver. Somebody um, gifted me their body so that I could learn. Mm-hmm. And it, it's one of the most beautiful gestures mm-hmm. that you could ever make. I mean, I don't know this person. Clearly, they didn't know me. They weren't alive. <laughs> and, and by their grace, I was able to hold a human heart and dissect a human heart. And under- so when I talk to someone about their heart, I have a visualization. I've held a heart. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I want to give back. I want to pay that forward. Uh, you know, and, and I, I like to remind people, it's free to donate your body. And there's a burial that the medical school pays for. Wow. So there's no cost to the family. I actually had a tremendous honor my last year in medical school. I got to speak at one of these one of these burials where all of the bodies that had been studied for the course of the year were subsequently cremated, and there was a there was a service and a in a burial, mm. and I got to speak at that, uh, and I got to talk wow. to some of those families, and so I, I that's my wishes, you know. So now it's in perpetuity. So it is <laughs> all right. Thank you, thank so, you for that opportunity. Absolutely. If they come to me, I've got yeah. the answers. Yeah, just point them, point them to the podcast. They actually yeah. he recorded himself talking about it. Episode forty nine. Bam. <laughs> you can put that in your advanced directive. I will. <laughs> um, well, thank you for that. Um, a really important conversation that I frankly haven't heard anybody have. So thank you for uh, initiating that on, on your channel and sharing it on mine. Oh, you're welcome. So when I knew we were going to be doing this, I put uh, out on all my social channels and in my FUMS Friday night six pack, which is my weekly newsletter, that I was going to be interviewing you for the pod. And I asked people if they had any questions they wanted me to ask you on their behalf. Well, the response was overwhelming. So I could only take a fraction of the questions that were sent to me. I'd like to ask those of you, if you don't mind, and to everyone whose questions aren't asked in this episode, please go to Dr. Boster's YouTube channel and ask him your questions there, which reminds me, I'll have a link to this to his YouTube channel in the show notes. So just go to FUMSnow.com forward slash episode 49 to find all of the click, clickable links on how to find Dr. Boster. So, okay, let's get to the questions. Let's do it. Um, I'm going to apologize ahead of time for what I'm assuming will be a plethora of mispronunciations. Okay. No so, worries whatsoever. From Debbie Coppett, C-O-P-O-T, from Downers Grove, Illinois. 
my 19 year old has had MS for the past six years. Oh my gosh. And like everyone, we're hoping and praying for something to make it all better or at least help a little bit. Can you ask what Dr. Boster thinks of the following? And what she sent was an article about Sobiterone? Yep, Sobiterone. Yep, okay, you are. so yep. what is that and what do you think about it? Well, let's unpack this question because it's actually a rather complex, um, complex message. Okay. Uh, the, the first thing that I want to I call out is the fact that we're dealing with pediatric onset multiple sclerosis. You know, and, and I am of the very strong opinion, you don't get to have MS by yourself. You know, you have MS with your village. And that's mm-hmm. never more exemplified than when you're diagnosed as a child. And so here is not a, a person directly impacted by MS, but a care partner, a mom mm-hmm. saying, hey, and, and I just, I want to, I want to commend her. Um, I, you know, it's such a, a beautiful thing to have an advocate and, you know, there's <laughs> no more powerful advocate than somebody's mom. True. Um, True so so I, I, I just want to call that out. Uh, yeah. I, I also want to say that the sentiment of we, we're, we're looking, we're searching. Um, and I don't want to use the word desperation because that's not what I'm hearing, but, but there's, a, there's a, an emotional drive. Um, this is an incurable condition in 2019. And there's an emotional drive. And, and as any parent would embrace, you know, what can be done? And so I'm hearing that. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and I want to speak to that. I want to honor that. The, the, the specifics that they're asking, um, this particular compound is a, a thyroid mimic drug. So mm-hmm. your thyroid produces various, um, various th- uh, hormones, uh, thyroxine and a bunch of other stuff. And this, um, th- th- this, this compound is a unique um, mimetic. So the word mimetic, it's like a mimicker of, mm-hmm. of one of these hormones. And the thing that makes it a bit interesting is that this particular compound can easily penetrate into the central compartment. Now, I do not believe that the research for this particular fibromimetic is, uh, is prime time. It's not, it's not remotely close to prime time. Mm. But I, I, I want to use it to make a point. There is a tremendous, tremendous international effort to beat the crap out of this disease, to to put the brakes on it, to hopefully eradicate it. And, and this is an example of that. Here are some researchers, and it's early, who have identified a compound created for purpose X, and they're saying, golly gee, maybe this would help out in purpose Y, and, and specifically here in MS. Mm-hmm. And whereas I don't think that we need to run out and buy stock in the compound or we need to start taking it off label, I, I think it speaks to um, the early efforts. You know, mm-hmm. the other piece to this is, Many people don't realize that when a drug hits the market, like when a drug becomes FDA approved, it's been studied for 20 to 30 years, literally. I I don't Mm -hmm. mean that figuratively. And so now with the advent of easy access to uh, medical publications, you know, PubMed is an online portal that I read every morning as soon as Mm -hmm. I wake up. Um, and, And so anyone who has internet access can gain access to research as it hits the as it hits the the first press. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that that's exciting and I love when people are um, seeking out education. But I also think that we have to put it into context. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. When I was a resident, again I'm going back to when I had hair, um, I there was a paper that came out where the mouse model of multiple sclerosis, which is called the EAE model, it's a mm-hmm. mouse model that mimics MS, um, they found that if they gave these mice with a version of MS, very high dose statins, so Zocor, a cholesterol mm-hmm. lowering agent, mm-hmm. it seemed to cure their uh, mouse version of MS. And I read this paper and I, and I, and I ran to my, my mentor, who was the MS guy at the uh, University of Michigan where I was training. And I said, you know, Dr. Michael, Dr. Michael, look at this. Can we start to give our patients high dose statins? And he read through the article and he said, Aaron, why don't we wait until it's tested in humans? <laughs> and and, and, you know, I, and I, I kind of thought, well, okay. So if you then fast forward over the next five, 10 years, it, it did enter into human trials. And there was three trials that came out, one that looked positive, one that looked like it didn't work. And so there was a tiebreaker trial. Mm-hmm. And I remember very anxiously awaiting the results of this particular trial. And the conclusion from this particular trial was, when you took a high-dose statin and combined it with interferon, it made the patient worse. Mm. 
And my point here is that it's very, very appropriate to be excited about a thyroid mm-hmm. And I, I, and I love the fact that this, this care partner, this mom is, is actively learning. That, that's a beautiful thing. Right. But I also think that we have to appreciate the scientific process. And, um, you know, those, uh, th- those articles, I hope, if, if nothing else, inspire hope that there are fleets of brilliant scientists around the world trying to crack this nut. And I think that's an example. That's such an important point. You and I talked uh, offline a little bit about this, that I hear every single day people saying there's no incentive to, for a cure to be found. It's much more advantageous uh, to treat symptoms than to find a cure. And I loved your answer. Well, you know, thank you. I, I, um, I'll uh, excuse the passion in my voice before I start sharing, but, you know, it's something I feel very strongly about. That's not true. Yeah. Um, it, the, the, the reality is that, um, it, it, you know, that, that the goal here is to make the disease go away. And the reality is our understanding of the immune system and our understanding of the interface of the immune system into the nervous system, which is really the interface where MS occurs, is fledgling. Mm-hmm. We, we, we're still, you know, just a year and a half ago, we learned that the brain had a lymphatic drainage system. We didn't know that. Right. And, you know, when I was in medical school, again, not that long ago, you know, I was taught that MS didn't involve B cells, that it only mm-hmm. involved T cells. I was taught that it didn't involve gray matter. It only involved white matter. And I was taught that it didn't involve pain. And mm-hmm. all three of those things are just absolutely false. But it wasn't that long ago. And so right. our understanding of the immunopathogenesis, the cause behind MS, is really fledgling. It's not there yet. And it's not that we don't want to cure the disease. God, it would, it, you know, that would be amazing. Uh, I think I, I want to point out that in non-surgical fields, okay, so outside of surgery in some forms of cancer, we cure nothing in medicine. <laughs> and I'll use diabetes as an example. Diabetes used to kill people. Mm -hmm. So not that long ago, a couple generations ago, if you had diabetes, that was a death sentence because 20 years down the line, your kidneys would go into kidney failure and you would pass. Nowadays, diabetes is boring. No, we don't, (laughs) we don't cure diabetes. Someone who has diabetes, my cousin is a type one diabetic. She's an amazing woman. She's a PhD, brilliant, um, has a gorgeous family. And, And she was diagnosed with diabetes as a child. She, she wears an insulin pump. She has to be meticulous about not just her diet, not just her exercise, uh, not just about her health maintenance, but about, about controlling her, her diabetes. And, mm-hmm. and it's not easy. I mean, remotely, I'm not trying to suggest that, right. but, but through hard work, she's made her diabetes boring. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not a cure, but, mm-hmm. but I think that quite honestly, in our lifetimes, we will make MS boring. I, I don't <laughs> think that it's realistic uh, if I'm, if I'm, transparently honest, that we're going to cure it in my lifetime, not, not because there isn't a desire, but because the knowledge isn't there yet. Mm-hmm. But even, even now, 2019, as we record this, we have patients in clinic where we have achieved boring. You know, we're, we're, <laughs> awesome. we're, you know and, and my, my feel-good moment in clinic is when a patient comes in and says, Dr. Boster, I think you're full of shit. I don't believe I have MS. <laughs> you know, and, and when right. someone challenges their diagnosis, Aaron did a good job. You know, yeah. Um, be, because if we're having a conversation about my dog or my children or your last vacation, we're not talking about loss of function. We're not mm-hmm. talking about loss of work or loss of love, and and that's really the goal. And so, yeah. I, I guess I just want to state it, there the 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 um, conspiratorial idea that you know big pharma and and the powers that be are hiding or not interested in, in finding a cure is false. And I'll point out that there's a lot of trials going on with vaccines. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's trials going on looking at remyelination and neuroprotection. And if you have to have MS, now's the best time to have it right. because of what we can bring to the table, but we're not there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, the but we're getting there. We are. We're, 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 <laughs> we're getting, getting we're so there. Much, we're so much closer than we've ever been. And I think that having a expectation of boring is a righteous and approachable expectation for this disease. 
Right. Okay, everybody. Our goal is to have boring MS. I like it. Um, you know, I joke, I joke, I want people to have excitement in the boardroom and in the bedroom, hopefully, and on the playing field. I want clinic to be boring. I like <laughs> it. Yeah, I love that. Um, so, okay, from Connie Bigelow, Dwayne, any recommended age to stop DMDs if you've been on them for 25 years with no relapses? She mentions yes, she's 72 uh, yeah. years old. 100%. I feel very strongly that you don't use DMTs after death. So <laughs> when, a, when a patient expires, it is, it is ethically Stop inappropriate. Them then. It is ethically inappropriate to continue d- disease modification. Now, I like it. Prior, prior to death, I don't think we should stop. Okay. Here's why. Um, yes, the immune system becomes quiet in the 70s and 80s. That's true. And there's even some research, although it's flawed research, that the efficacy of a given DMT might be less impactful at age 65 as compared to 25. And, mm-hmm. and that's not proven, but there's some suspicion of that. Mm-hmm. But, but the person still has an immune system, and the immune system is still attacking the holiest of holies, the supercomputer that runs the body, the brain, and the superhighway, you know, the spinal mm-hmm. cord that takes all the information from the brain down to the tootsies and back up. And if you have functions at age 72 or at age 52 or whatever, that you like, mm-hmm. I want to keep them for you. I, I, I want to keep them intact. Um, I, I don't want to risk you losing them. Mm-hmm. And so there's a study that I think highlights this point where they took a bunch of uh, people with MS that were over the very young age, in my opinion, of 55. And if they had Thank had you five for that, years, by the way. That's, you know, as, <laughs> as I age, old yes. and recalibrated. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> I know. I remember when I thought, man, People who are 40 are old. You know, oh, I mean, right. Of course, of course yeah. I, I was a munchkin. So, yeah. you know, people, so in this, in this trial, we had folks that were 55 or older that had, had no attacks in five years on disease modifying therapy. Mm-hmm. And they randomly took half the patients off their drug and kept half the patients on their drug. And they followed them for a couple of years. And the way the paper was written was infuriating. It said, you know, it, it, it looks like it doesn't matter if you come off because only a third of the patients progressed in their disability. You know, you know and, and so Only my, my immediate response is, if that one third include my <laughs> mother... in that third? Yeah. yeah if, that, if, if that third was my mom, I'm not okay with that. Right. And so, and so what I think is a rational approach is not to just stop because you're ageist and you say, well, you've achieved X birthday, so we're done. It's to think of the individual as just that, as a human, as an individual, and to look at the risk benefit of a given therapy in that person. So let me paint two pictures. Imagine someone who is, and we'll just use this example of someone who's 72 and they've been injecting themselves and it makes them have the flu and they feel God awful and they have a a temperature and arthralgias, their bones ache and they're nauseated and they throw up Mm -hmm. and they're miserable and they can't eat for two days. And they have spots all over where they've been injecting themselves. And and, and the the treatment is actually making, is, is destroying the quality of their life. The risk benefit for that individual might favor stopping that particular therapy, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm not saying that you never stop anyone. I just don't think that we need to make these draconian rules that we stop at a given point. Mm-hmm. Conversely, let's take um, another 72 year old who is taking a once a day pill for MS, has zero side effects. The drug is easily covered by the insurance or what have you. Then I, I don't want to stop that because yeah. maybe the reason that they're doing well is because they're on therapy. Now, mm-hmm. I, I do believe that in the concept of de-escalation. And so I think that as we constantly reevaluate the moving target of a, of a human, the risk benefit of a given therapy changes as that human ages. Mm-hmm. And so it is reasonable, in my opinion, that you could consider de-escalating your therapy, your disease modification from something that's maybe highly effective with lots of potential side effects and risk to something down the line that might be mild to moderately effective, but much more tolerated. Mm -hmm. And and, and again, I think if the guiding principle isn't ageism, you know, you've reached the age of X, therefore we're done. And, and you know, the guiding principle is not population medicine, which is what we're talking about in populations, this percentage, that percentage. If instead the focus is on the individual human in that family, I think we're more prone to make the proper decision. Mm -hmm. Um, but just to summarize, if you're dead, you shouldn't take DMT, period. Perfect. Love it. There's the quote. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, I am trying to be very respectful of your time. So I'm just going to tell everybody, we're not going to get to all the questions. Again, just go to FUMSnow.com forward slash episode 49. All of the links will be there to find Dr. Boster. You can go ask him questions on his YouTube channel, but I'll finish up with two um, big questions. Well, and let me just throw this out to you that I, um, if invited, would be very happy to come back on this podcast oh and my answer your questions. So, gosh, yes! So, um, so, so, you know, please, uh, if you send an invitation, the answer is yes. Oh, my. Yes. Okay. Hallelujah. We'll All right, make that happen. Thank you. Okay. Again. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So um, I think this is particularly important right now, and that is the flu shot. So I'm always amazed at this back and forth and people digging in their heels and yes, I'm right. No, I'm whatever. What's what, what say you? So says me, um, the following, the flu influenza kills people. I mean, they literally, it it, it, can, every, every winter it it kills human beings. Right. On the upside, you would no longer have to take those DMTs just to be clear. Yeah. There's enough, there's an upside for everything. And and that might be it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, it, the flu is not a benign, it's, you know, people say the word flu when they're referring to a little croup or a little viral, right. whatever, whatever. And it, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about influenza A, which, which takes lives. It's, mm-hmm. it's, not a, it's not a small matter. Now, what, what, what's it, what we're trying to do with the flu shot, we take last year's major flu strains, you know, whichever viruses those were. And we isolate them in a petri dish, and we murder them. We we literally blend them up, and so we we kill the virus, and we have little chunks of viral protein, mm-hmm. and we put it in solution, and we inject it into your shoulder or your buttock, you know, depending on the nurse's opinions. <laughs> and and what we're doing is we're show, yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> we're showing we're showing your immune system last year's prevalent viruses, but we're not showing it live virus. We're showing it dead virus. And we're allowing your immune system to then build an arsenal against those proteins. Mm -hmm. Now, the hope is that this year's viral strains, at least some of them, are are consistent from last year. You know, viruses mutate very quickly. And -hmm. and we're taking a guess that at least, you know, let's make up a number, 70% or 50%, you know, are going to overlap. Yeah. In that way, if, God forbid, you come in contact with flu during the flu season, your immune system is primed to fight that infection and it gives you a fighting chance. You know, we don't have antibiotics for, the, for viruses mm-hmm. uh, with, with a couple of rare exceptions. You know, we can't give you an antibiotic and clear the flu bug. And so, so that's what we're asking people to do when we get a yearly flu shot. And it's really, in my opinion, an important thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will highlight that we don't want to take live attenuated virus. And right. typically those are the sprays up your nose. So no, mm-hmm. no sprays, but the injection, you know, the, in the muscle, that's, that's always a dead virus. And that's mm-hmm. the kind that we want to give you. Now, right. I, I think that it's a best practice that people with MS have a flu shot once a year. And particularly if you are immunosuppressed or if you're a, a bit older um, or what, ha- or if there's other risk factors, I think it's even more important. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the issues, uh, be, be, uh, are twofold. One is a concern about if I give you a, a vaccination, could it trigger an attack? And the answer mm-hmm. is no. Um, one is if I give you a vaccination, you know, could it make you have the flu? Well, if you're using dead virus, no, it mm-hmm. can make you feel flu like for a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third concern is uh, whether or not the MS therapy that you're on could impact the success of the flu shot. Mm -hmm. And the third part that I just mentioned, the answer is yes, it could. And Mm -hmm. so this is uh, something to discuss with your, uh, with your MS care provider, but I'll use an example. Um, The most prescribed MS medicine in the United States today is an infusion called Ocrelizumab, codenamed for Ocrevus, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is a twice annual infusion. It's an immunosuppressant agent that selectively kills B cells. And B cells, by the way, are involved in mounting um, responses to vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so if you get a Ocrevus infusion and then a couple days later get a flu shot, and this has been studied, it works, but it doesn't work as well. So so it it doesn't cause an attack. It doesn't make your MS worse. It doesn't make you have the flu. But the timing, if you did the flu shot just, you know, very shortly after the Ocrevus infusion, the, 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 
immunologic response to flu would be attenuated. It wouldn't be as robust. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean in English? Well, what it means is the ideal time, like the perfect situation to take a flu shot as it relates to this ocrevus is like four to six weeks prior to your next infusion, because that's when your B cells are most likely to have come back as much as they're gonna. Mm -hmm. And it gives your body time to mount an immune response before you get your next dose. However, many people you know, they, their flu, their, their immune, immunization schedule and their ocrevus schedule aren't aligned. Mm -hmm. And so very commonly a, a patient calls and says, gosh, what am I supposed to do? You know, I just got my ocrevus and now a month later, I'm supposed to get my flu shot. And my answer is do it. Yeah. So, so the, the, the take home is vaccines work, immunizations work, flu kills you. Those are all serious things. Yeah. And I think people with MS are best served in the same way that healthcare providers are best served by getting a flu vaccine, we just want it to be a dead virus. Right. And we want to talk to our MS provider to make sure that whatever disease modifying therapy we're on, if there's a proper timing, that we time it appropriately. Yeah. Love that. Perfect. I just um, got in a little bit of hot water, which I don't mind one bit, but <laughs> I, posted, <laughs> I posted something uh, the other day um, and it said something like, hey, asshole, get the flu shot. It's not about you. Yeah, and yeah. the point being, those people around us who go, yeah, I haven't had the flu for a long time. Why, why bother? Um, pisses me off. So I'm yep. like, well, what about the elderly folks? What about the little yep. babies? What about me? So well, and, and to, to, your, to your point, and, and I agree with you, actually, what, what we're trying to accomplish with a vaccine is called herd immunity. Mm-hmm. Herd like a herd of cattle. Yeah. And so if you think about a virus, a virus needs a host. And so if, if you imagine, uh, just paint a picture in your head of 100 people in a swimming pool, which might be awkward, but just humor me. <laughs> so you got 100 people in a swimming pool and all of them are vaccinated against a particular pathogen. Mm-hmm. And one person, despite being vaccinated, gets, gets the pathogen, they get the flu. Mm-hmm. That flu bug can't travel to anyone else because everyone else is immunized. And so the flu dies, mm-hmm. you know, just because it can't, it can't survive. Right. However, if only 50% of the people are vaccinated, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Because now now that flu bug can, when you sneeze, it can find a second host and a third host and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. And so the vaccination programs only work if everyone participates. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's actually been a travesty. Uh, there's been a movement of anti-vaxxers, which has been promoted initially yeah. by some false science. There's actually yes. a scientist who has been disbarred essentially mm-hmm. he's been um he's been you know s- stripped of his titles and his papers have been removed because he lied actually right. and he promoted this false concept that vaccines actually uh, contributed to autism which is false yeah and and if i may if i may be blunt some you know some famous uh, actors and actresses got on board and started jenny to McCarthy. promote yeah <laughs> and you know we we love jenny mccarthy not because of her phd in immunology you know <laughs> We love Jenny McCarthy not because of her eight years of medical training. We love Jenny McCarthy for other reasons. And, mm-hmm. and so whereas we might thoroughly enjoy her body of work, it's not appropriate to listen to her medical advice because it's not. It's, um, right. it's conjecture. And so yeah, I, 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 I think you know, it, it actually is really important that we don't, um, that, that we don't forget that. And, and you're right. I think the, the, the responsible thing to do um, is as, as a community member, as a village member, as someone who takes their health seriously, is to participate in these programs. You know, we uh, have the fortunate advantage of not knowing what it's like to be ravaged by measles. Mm-hmm. Measles killed a third of Europe. A third. Like it wiped out a third of a population back in the ancient days of yesteryear. And mm-hmm. we're oblivious to that because of successful vaccination programs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's there, people. <laughs> Use yeah, it. Yeah, yeah for real. <laughs> well, um, my last question I'm actually going to hold, since you've been so kind in offering to come back, this this last question is a huge one. So we definitely don't have time to cover this, but I'll use that as a teaser and say, Dr. Boster, please come back and talk to us about HSCT. The, um, oh, stem cell I would stuff. love to. I would love uh, to. That's it. That's, that'll be a date. Um, yeah. Offline, you and I will come up with uh, a time and hopefully in the near future, 
Fantastic. And we will have a robust discussion about hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, and, yeah. and sort of that whole that whole um, that whole process. Yeah. That's really that's really a, um, a hot topic. Oh, interesting. So I'm just going to give a shout out to Kevin Keplinger who keeps this in the forefront um, and has asked this question. And Kevin, come back. We're going to be talking with Dr. Boster about it. I promise. Absolutely. Um, this has been such an amazing and informative conversation, Dr. Boster. I thank you so much for spending this time and oh, helping answer these questions and enlighten us with your experience and training. Um, if people want to lo- learn more about you or ask more questions or just follow up on you, where do they find you? Uh, so, you know, l- let me start by saying thank you to you. Uh, you are a amazing uh, community member and village member for so many people. And um, what your efforts uh, through social media, through this podcast, it, it don't go unnoticed. And so I want to thank you as a family impacted by MS and as an MS doctor for your efforts, because it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's efforts like yours that really up our game and, and do God's work. So thank you. And thank you also for the opportunity to talk with you this morning. Oh um, you know, if, if people are, if people are uh, looking to, uh, to listen to my silly voice, uh, <laughs> there's a couple locations on the interweb. So um, I have a Twitter account. It's um, at Aaron Boster MD. So uh, just my name. And I and that's post, Aaron, like A A Ron. Right? Yeah, like a brother of Moses. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> so it. it's, it's at A A R O N B is in boy O S T E R M D. And you know that that Twitter account really. I every morning when I wake up and I review PubMed, if there's an article that catches my eye, I'll tweet out a couple comments about it or some links. Uh, when I travel to congresses or when there's um, really robust discussions, I'll tweet about those things. And so. You know, that's, uh, you know, I, I, I probably put out a little bit of content every day. And so that's one location. Uh, the, the second place is on my Facebook page, same name, Aaron Boster, MD. Uh, Facebook scares me a little bit. I'm not as uh, savvy or, or, or familiar with it, but most people have Facebook. And, and so I have um, a lot of that. You, a lot of that content is, is, is available there on my Facebook page. Probably the place that I uh, am most passionate about these days is the YouTube channel. Yeah. And so, you know, you can find me on YouTube if you type in Aaron Boster MD. Um, you can find my channel. And, you know, if you subscribe and, and ring that notifications bell, it'll alert you when I put out new content. I try to make a video once to twice a week. Um, now, full disclosure, I actually make a lot more videos than that because I don't have any friends. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, but, but, I, but I, I, I try to hold back and I, and I publish videos typically on Mondays and Thursdays. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I really love doing YouTube live streams. And I, <clears throat> I do live streams, catch as catch can, when my wife and family say, yeah, go ahead. And so <laughs> they're normally not, um, I'm not savvy enough to plan them ahead of time. So if you, if you have the notifications go click, then it alerts you, hey, Boster's online. And, and, you know, I love it when people jump on these live streams. So those yeah. are locations where you, you can find me. Awesome. And just to remind everybody again, at FUMSnow.com forward slash episode 49, I will have all of these notes and all of these clickable links to be able to find Dr. Boster. So well, thank you. finally, Dr. Boster, we here in the FUMS nation speak to this stupid diseases it deserves and we tell it FUMS every day. If you would, please lead us in the salute to MS with middle finger extended, of course. On I've three, got my are you... middle finger. I've got my middle, <laughs> middle finger held high in the air. Okay, me too. Ready? On three. Yep. Ready? One, two, three. F-U-M-S. Oh, that was a beautiful F-U-M-S. That was a great one. Thank you Love so it. much again. And we will be in touch to uh, get you back on the show. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you listening to the F-U-M-S podcast show. Be sure to subscribe to it so you won't miss an episode. You can do that right on the website at FUMSnow.com. While you're there, sign up for the free email list so you'll be among the first to know of any new findings in MS research, new therapies and products, as well as any blog posts and podcast episodes I release. Want to chat with others in the FUMS community? Join us on Facebook at FUMS Now. Thanks again, and don't forget to talk to the stupid disease as it deserves. Tell it FUMS every day.